And we, we after Avamondia, we went on a Korean beekeeping tour, and um, beekeeping is always interesting, no matter where you go. But the thing that really, there are a few things that really shocked me about Korea, uh, South Korea, we're talking, um, is, oh jeez, they make our roads and that look, uh, they make us look third rate, I tell you. You know, we never went on a bad road anywhere. And most of the country, only 68% of it is mountains. It's all peaks and mountains. They live in all the valleys and, 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 and um, the harbors. Very steep mountains. Very steep mountains, all wooded. And you've got all like uh, the valleys, all just um, like ribbons uh, along, with apartments all built there because 70 odd percent of the people live in apartments uh, in high rise. And right beside them is the fertile ground that they grow their rice, their igloos to grow all their vegetables, their, their uh, kimchi, which I still don't like. Um, <laughs> and everything was too hot over there. I, I, it wasn't quite to my taste Korean food, but anyway. Um, but, you know, we went, even on country roads, there was nothing like our roads. Uh, you know, we went, you go through one mountain in a tunnel, then you go on a big bridge, a big concrete bridge over the valley to the next mountain and go through another tunnel and then to the next bridge. And you just travel to one level virtually slightly up or slightly down just for miles and miles and you're not going on any hills over over um, the Merbu North Hill or anything like that. They just go straight through. If they were here, they'd go straight through the ball, you know, it's a, it's a Don't go over the hills, you know. And I couldn't get over it, you know, it was just and it was just everywhere. It was all these big toll roads, big roads, like the Geelong Melbourne Road. That was that was about the, the uh, standard of of them. But if it was a hill, straight through. Um, and, big, and if it was a valley, straight over the top of the bridge. Um, and then when we got up into the DMZ, as they call it, the demilitarised zone, up near North Korea, and I feel really sorry for them because, you know, that those North Koreans, they're just mad. They just don't know when they're ever going to have a go at them and that. And um, so they're really on, you know, tender hooks the whole time. And we went, and it's, but it's a good place for beekeeping because, see, You've got the demilitarised zone, you've got four kilometres of unused land. And unused land has deer, animals, um, plants, flowers, so the bees don't have to worry, they fly over into it. And so the beekeepers are all along the demilitarised zone. And it was good area. So we went in this bus, you know, big bus, everything was big bus, no little buses, big buses. And, you know, it struck me, we go down little farmers' lanes, you know, and they're concrete roads. But when you think about it, I suppose if you're going to have a war and you're going to have tanks and things and big heavy machinery getting around to fight, well, you don't want them getting bogged, you know, out of Paddy's Corner, so you have good roads. But the other thing, too, is we went to a B site and as we went along, there was these big concrete structures and they had, oh, I see the old sort of ripple pattern thing in them. I thought, oh, that's funny, they must stand in there and shoot from out around the, the corners or something, you know. And after we'd gone past the guy, I said, oh, I forgot to show you, that's the tank traps. And what happens is when, when they were invaded the first time, the tanks just flooded in from the north and took over instantly because they didn't have any way of fighting back. You see, they didn't have tanks. But they won't get away with it now. They must have explosives under these big concrete barriers because somehow they go bang and they block the roads with them. And so the tanks won't be running in again in the future because you've got all these tank traps. Um, so, you know, they've, they've thought it out, they've got it well planned. And we went down in into a tunnel of where there's four tunnels that they found and who knows how many more, and they only woke up about this because a defector told them I've been building a tunnel. And they then started putting bores down until they found it, and then they found more of them. And the North Koreans' plan was they were going to come through a tunnels and 30,000 men in an hour could race through these tunnels and overwhelm Seoul and they were going to invade. So, you know, it's, they're in a terrible position. And the other thing too is, you know, just before we left, it all looked like there was all propaganda, wars and fighting and all that sort of thing over there. But we never got told the real story. You know, never trust the media. They only ever tell you half the story. They always get it wrong. What it was, was, you know, they said there was people, two people got killed by mines. 
Well, what it was is they float the bombs down the Han River, and that flows into South Korea. So the bombs blow people up. And that's, that's what it was about. It wasn't mines that someone walked over or anything. It was actually a floating mine that came down the river. So, you know, we never get told the full story. But anyway, getting back to the full story, what you want to hear about. Um, so the beekeeping over there, much to our shock and amazement, because it's a very cold place, it's, a lot of the bees must be kept in shelters. So the first place we go to, we walk up this uh, little, you know, um, we drive down and we have to get out of the bus and go up beside the um, farmhouses, see a few bees along the way, get up there, and here's this great big igloo, about as wide as this room, I suppose, nearly, roughly, and it's high, and it seemed to have like black shade cloth on the top with plastic underneath. And here's all the hives, all along the outsides, all facing out. And you're all connected up to, uh, the best way I'd describe it is like a dripper system uh, here, uh, with uh, sugar syrup. And they've got little float um, feeders in the hive so that the sugar syrup gets to the right height and stops. And the bees have to drink a bit before it goes down. And then big blocks of uh, bee feed, which I think come from China. It's um, a concoction of... Uh, Supplements made out of uh, pollen and stuff like that. And the bees are just artificially fed. Sugar, pollen, supplement. They produce $1,000 worth of royal jelly per hive per year. Do a bit of a count up. There's 300 hives uh, just around where we can see, isn't there? So, uh, you know, it's, uh, and also the reason they're in the shelter, protect the bees, but you can work in the rain. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if it rains or whatever, because you're in under the shelter, so are the bees. Um, so that was interesting. So when we went on to another place, we found the same thing, except it was a bit more high-tech. It was uh, actual, like, carports. Once again, all the bees all lined up, all the pipes under the ground, all the feeders all into the hives. Um, but they can unconnect them and move the bees. Um, some move the bees, and I think some don't. We also went to a queen breeding establishment, and... Um, they were intending for this next season to produce 10,000 instrumentally inseminated queen bees to distribute to the beekeepers. It's actually a state-owned um, bee breeding centre to actually improve the genetics of the bees. I was quite surprised. All the bees we saw were bright yellow Italians, but they were very quiet. Um, and uh, it's a pity if I, had, I could, if I had a projector thing, I could show you some photos of it, but anyway. Um, Well, we probably didn't get to taste that oh. because what we tasted here generally was acacia honey and other nice stuff, but who knows? The wasp wine was all right. Oh, I didn't have the wasp wine. They, they catch wasps and then they make wine out of them. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> they do all sorts of weird, wonderful things, you know. And um, they've got a... Uh, I, I had a couple of nights where I was by myself, you see, and I wandered down the street the first night and... And I go down and I wander around and I looked at all these pla eating places as I went and I thought, oh, I'm not eating Japanese, you know, and I'm not going in that one. And, oh, that's pizzas now, don't you want pizzas at home? So anyway, I look up this little alleyway and here's this little restaurant sort of thing, an uh, eating place, and they're all sitting on like wooden uh, blocks, you know, uh, stumps. And I look around and they're all, every table seems to have the same meal on it. And I thought, oh, that's all right, and that doesn't look too bad. It was quite a big meal on a plate. So I sit down and the woman looks at me, you know, in the way, so she comes over and she's got no English and I've got no Korean, so I point at the board and I say, what? So anyway, no, 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 she's not going to serve me. So she goes off outside, finds a young lad and brings him in and he can speak English. So he comes in, he sits down, oh, hello, where are you from? You know, I say, oh, that's good, you know. He said, this restaurant has rules. Oh, yeah, what's the rules? Oh, one person's not allowed to eat. It has to be for two. I said, don't worry, tell the lady, bring out the meal for two, and one man will eat it, and he'll pay for it. <laughs> oh, okay, so anyway, so out, out came the standard thing that they all, every table got. So she walks past, bottle of cold water, can, a young, uh, folding a uh, cardboard box thing, box thing of uh, some sort of, Juice, or I'm not sure what the juice was, but it was anyway juice of some sort. And then out came a platter with this uh, fried eggs. Well, they were boiling, it was red hot uh, cast iron platter with two raw eggs.
days on that, that sort of thing. That looked very good. But anyway, she obviously saw me there mucking around with us, and she came along and got the chopsticks and cooked it on the uh, on the thing. And thought I was an idiot, I suppose. Anyway, so then, <laughs> then she goes off and comes back and plops a big plate in the middle of the table. Oh, it looks really good, you know. It's like like a big pl uh, pizza size plate with all meat stuff on the bottom, and then other stuff around, and then it's on the top is like a rice bowl that's been tipped upside down, and I could see that it was uh, bean shoots with um, corn in it, and you know, something else, whoever know, whatever. So anyway, so I start to tackle it, and I discovered that the, the bit in the middle was um, ribs, and they were cooked to perfection. Oh, absolutely melted in your mouth. The only problem was, you couldn't feel your mouth, because everything was so hot. <laughs> the steam was coming out the nose, my eyes were bleeding. <laughs> I couldn't feel my mouth. <laughs> but anyway, and, and I don't know whether it was wasabi or what it was in the top stuff, because there was no, it was unrelenting. The bottom was kim kimchi with the uh, uh, pickled uh, cabbage, cabbage in the uh, chili. The ribs were hot, and then whatever was on the top was even hotter. So, <laughs> so anyway, I went home. Back to the hotel, uh, uh, feeling rather hot. Um, so the next night, I'm riding down the street. I was just sort of looking, thinking, "Where am I going to eat tonight?" You know. And this bloke grabs me and he pulls me over, and you know, so I didn't mean it to me. It's only squiggle, you know. So he goes in, and we go into this little alleyway thing, and he presses a button on a leaf, and we hop in the leaf, and we go up. <laughs> and I thought this could be interesting. <laughs> 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 To the brothel of SH Power, or he's going to do me over. I wonder which one, anyway. Do this fling over. And, and go in, and here's this first thing I see is this great big fish tank in front of me. And here's all these toadfish swimming around. Oh. <laughs> so I sit down, and out comes the menu. I can't read it, it's all the squiggle. So, so she comes back with another one, and in microscopic writing underneath the squiggle is English. And it was all blowfish soup, blowfish soup, blowfish cutlets, blowfish. Um, it was all different sorts of thick blowfish. So anyone would know. So toadies, yeah. So I had, I had a toad, toadfish soup, and I didn't realise this, but toadies are actually like sharks. You've got cartilage in them. They're not bones, and they must just go chop, 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 and, and throw it all in. So I fished all the floating skin out, and I fished out the cartilage. <laughs> With metal chopsticks, <laughs> and they're not very easy to handle. <laughs> and I didn't think it was very good to eat. Anyway, so the funny thing about Korea, the main course you pay for, but you don't pay for the condiments. So you can eat as many condiments as you like. So I didn't think much of his soup, so I'm there thinking, oh, yes, yeah, so the kimchi, I mean, I've had that, that's my, the white radish, I'm not quite that keen on that. But there was these little crunchy bits all over the bag. So I'm there with the chopsticks eating these little crunchy ones. And she comes back and gives me another one. And I'm, 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 I'm on to about the end of the second bowl. And I thought, I wonder what I'm eating. So I had a close look. <laughs> <laughs> it was garlic. Garlic. <laughs> garlic. Yeah. Somehow they pickled the garlic. And I thought, gee, I'd better be good going to this conference. I'm just thinking of it. Anyway, nobody seemed to say anything. So anyway. Right, and then back to what we came to talk about. We're not here to have jokes, we're here to talk about beef. <laughs> By roaming around the world and that, I've seen these mini nukes, but generally they're foam boxes, and um, they use them for queen breeding a lot. Now, back in the... when um, the, Bendigo Field Day was held out at Mandurin. Uh, one day, uh, a fellow called Bob Campbell, who was a commercial beekeeper, he demonstrated, he had one there made out of a foam fruit box. He cut it up, glued it together, and made a little mini new. Well, we saw this and thought, oh, that's a good idea. So we went home and, and in Dad's backyard in Geelong West, and we lived there, we set these up down the side of the house, and um, with little baby frames like this. Oh. Right? And the idea is you only need a cup full of bees, put a queen cell. The queens mate a lot quicker because something to do with the urgency of we've only got a small amount of bees and then, you know, what happens is the stronger the hive you put a queen cell in, 
the more likely it is not that, that the queen's not going to get mated or things are going to go wrong. Because obviously the bees must hold her back or whatever. So when there's not so many, she does what she wants to do. So she flies out, mates, comes back, and everything happens quicker. So, um, also too, people make hard work of, of their um, grafting their, their uh, queens. And what I found is, you know, they usually attach them to a bar with beeswax. Well, I found that I'd be there with a the soldering iron or whatever, putting a bit of beeswax and sticking the, the cups on. That all took time. So anyway, I came up with this better idea of where we made these little dowels. At one stage, we actually used to make them out of dowel, but then we discovered you could do it out of just even square. And you put a bit of wax here, and they'll stick on. And you just push them on, and the thing is, you can take them off easy. So it's all nice and easy for grafting. So that was one of my inventions. And um, then what happened is you get a day like the other day when it's raining, and you can't work your bees because it's wet and you know we had five mils of rain but it took all day for it to happen and you might be not that I'm complaining about the rain and I discovered in France you could buy these but once again the orientals don't take much to copy and so now you can buy them very easily from China because they copy them and what you do is generally on about the seventh or eighth day I put the, the cage over the cell, mm -hmm. so that if the queen, the queen can't be attacked and chewed down, because if they're going to chew them down, they often do it on about the eighth day or thereabouts, that's when they're vulnerable. And also, once the queen, if she hatches, you can then get her out, and what I do is I put a little dot on it, just a, sm a small dot, and I put her into one of these cages <coughs> with just a little bit of, of um, candy, about that much, so that when I put them in the um, new box, over, they can let them out overnight. It seems that you don't want them to be too slow getting out, but you don't want them to get out too fast. So um, that's how I did it. But anyway, I, when we were overseas, we saw in Russia, Turkey, Korea, um, probably quite a few other places, these mini nukes. But generally they were all mass produced foam boxes and sometimes plastic frames. But I didn't like some parts of it because I have made stuff with foam before and some places where I keep my bees, such as a Werribee, there's gigantic rats down there and they think nothing about chewing through a bit of foam to get to the, uh, not, well they'll even chew a hole through wooden ones and um, to get in and uh, chew at the entrance and make a hole to get in and tack your um, combs and things like that. So I knew the foam wouldn't have stand a chance there. So I made them up out of timber. And then the other thing I did, one of the, one of the slaves did a lot of it. And this was one of the best things I did, is I made it with a detachable bottom. And at this stage, we put a mesh bottom on them. And I was a bit worried about ants, and I thought, I wonder if the ants will just sail through these little black ants. But if you see ants around when well, you know that the nuke has died out, something's gone wrong. Uh, because the ants don't worry them if it's a good, strong, viable little nuke. But the beauty of it is, if one dies out a little bit, I can actually put it on top of the, uh, a strong one. And so it's just like adding supers to your hive. So last year, I started to get them going. And then what I did is through the winter, um, they overwintered in that backyard, uh, quite a few of them, and stacked up two and three high. And then I took them out to the canola, and I stacked them up about five and six high, and the queen just laid right up through the centre and, and filled them all up with brood and honey. It sounded good, it worked really well until the wind came and blew them all over. <laughs> so you know, had to go out and stand all back up, and you know, some of them got set back to over there. But the other thing too is, was a stroke of brilliance is to draw them is a real problem because when I was over in Turkey, you know, they they have two side by side and put them in a, a hive to draw and they'd end up with all this burr cane down the middle and whatever. But what I did is instead of having lugs on the frames, I took I put screws. Those screws hold them into a, a, a little um, top bar so that they go in and sit as a frame. And then when they filled them up and made them like that, I unscrew them, 
and put the same screw back into the sides and that then becomes the lugs for my little frames to sit in there. So it works really good and if I want to I can take them all back out, put them back and just put them into an uh, uh, ideal box, put them on a hive and the bees can look after them. Now, it's not all plain sailing. It is very good when it's working well and these queens have come out of one of the, uh, out of some of these um, today and um, they've, um, uh, you know, you can get almost 100% take of queens in these little mini nukes. They work really well. But one thing I'd suggest to you is quite a lot of the bees that come, queens that come down from Queensland and New South Wales are also produced in these little mini nukes, particularly in Queensland, they use them a lot. But don't go and put them into a big strong hive because see what's happened is this queen has developed in a small hive, in a small group of bees. So the more I've been thinking about it, you better actually to put the queen into a four frame nuke for a start. Take out two frames of seal brood with bees covering it, one frame of honey and pollen with, uh, from the outside wall with bees covering it, and one empty frame. And put the queen with that, make sure there's no queen cells or queen on there, or otherwise if it's queen cells, the bees never let the uh, queen out, or rarely do, um, because they always think we've got our own queen that's better, you know. And um, so, yeah, uh, and once, after a month, and she's laying and she's really established herself, then kill the queen in your other hive that you want to requeen, and use the newspaper method to unite onto the top, the new queen. Always put the new queen on the top because what happens is the nasty bees are all down here and you don't want the nasty bees on top walking past your new queen all the time because then they go, oh we don't like you and, and they grab hold of her and they chew her legs or wings or whatever. So put her on the top and she gets, I, I, uh, she gets looked after up there because the nasty bees stay down here and by the time they all become mates and they chew through that paper in 24 hours but that's all you need to for everyone to become happy with each other. It's just that initial time that's always the problem. But the better your honey flow, the less you have to worry. Now, something was said about clover before. As I drove down the road, I thought, aren't you lucky in Gippsland? Because I've just gone for a drive down to Colac last week, and you can't find any clover, because the farmers now down there don't let clover grow in their paddocks, because they put urea on the paddocks to grow fast-growing ryegrass called speed grass. It just kills the clover, and we've been too dry. We're not getting enough um, uh, rain as well, so as a result, the seed bank of clover is probably disappearing. But I don't think in the Western District there's hardly going to be anywhere you can get clover, and yet in the old days you could go down to some of those places around Kai and get three boxes of honey per hive off the clover, or even more, you know, particularly on the um, uh, uh, strawberry clover. Um, but it just you know, I drove around and I found one place, a hobby farm, and it had clover on it. But all the other dairy farms, high intensity dairy farms all around, there's no, it's just grass. And this other sad thing that's happening is um, the Chinese have bought so many, I don't know if they're buying the farms down here, but you know, at, on the edge of Colback, there's 12 farms all in one row, and they've bought the whole lot. They haven't taken them over yet, they're still being operated for another couple of years, and then it's all going to be amalgamated into one Chinese dairy farm. So I hope they like clover and start putting it back into it. And the thing that saves us now is that farmers are planting more lucerne in our area and that's been a godsend because the lucerne is just starting to flower now on one of my bee sites and the bees were working it. Um, but there's quite a bit of it and what happens is generally speaking in some cases the farmers graze it off and then after a couple of weeks it starts to come back and flower and that and it flowers for a week or ten days and they graze it off again or in some cases they cut it and um, uh, roll it up and um, in one case where I go they actually water it, they water it every three weeks and so as a result um, it grows and is quite good but they don't grow as much of it there as what they used to because there's more money in growing maize so um, that's changed. Yeah, same as your clover. Water okay. white, water white, yeah, you can see through it, it's just like, just like water, yeah. And there won't be much of it this year because 
in Western, uh, South Australia where they produce a lot of it around Keith and all over there because they produce seed for the world over there with pivot irrigators. They've got a wasp, so as a result they're going to sp they'll have to spray for this wasp. So if your bees are there, you're probably going to be, they'll belt your bees if you don't get them off. But the other thing too is because everything's a month in advance, um, the uh, season over there, um, they're locking up the paddocks already to set them for their seed production and stuff. So it's not going to be as good as when they do that around about December, January. The other thing about clover is this time of the year, your breeds will breed and breed and breed and they'll work it like mad. You'll see that dirty coloured um, pollen coming in. It's really good, high quality pollen. Your bees will breed like mad and with a few blackberries as well, it's uh, even better. Your blackberries will yield now. But what happens is you've got to get a bit of heat onto the clover for it then to really make honey. And what happens is they usually breed up and up and up and up and then theoretically, around about Christmas, then the honey starts to pour in. And when you can't even see the flowers in the paddock and you think it's all finished, that's usually when the bees are put, putting the honey in the hive the quickest and best. And where they get it from, I think they get that by out the fence post. But anyway, who knows? Um, but yeah, the, uh, but the only trap that we had is when we used to get clover down around Stevens Marsh, is sometimes the bees would get so strong with our excluders on them, they breed up and up and up and you get them four or five high. And we had one case where we had um, uh, bright yellow Italian bees with no excluders and I think there was something like 20 frames, 21 frames of brood in the, in the hives because they just bred so much. And the trouble is the biggest, the strongest of them then made a swarm that was so big you know, that blotted out the sun, you know. I thought, was, I thought it was the eclipse, you know. And, um, but, you know, if that didn't happen, by gee, you got a lot of honey, you know. So, um, yeah. But John, just with the clover at the moment, so if the bees work, yes. that'll be mainly pollen that we get. Yeah, but they'll be getting a lick of nectar off it because it's been, we've had warmer than usual conditions. It's basically the ground, I think the ground's got to get to 18 degrees temperature. Someone ought to go out and stick a thermometer into it and see. But once the ground gets warm enough, that's when it starts to yield. But it'll be making enough nectar that they'll breed and they'll get a lick off it. Yeah. But the real honey flow comes when it starts to dry out and the plant gets under stress. Yeah, so, and ideally, what you want is the farmers, for it to start to grow, flower, farmers cut the paddy because you don't want too much grass. You want the clover to come up and beat the grass. So you want paddocks that are being eaten out a lot. You don't want big tall grass all through it. And they cut it, and then the clover comes up thicker than, and quicker than the grass. Get a shower of rain on it, grows a bit more, and then it starts to get a bit stressed, and then it's yielding honey. And then as it's just about on its last week, it's another thunderstorm, and then you yield another lot of honey. And that's what happens with Patterson's Curse. But Patterson's Curse has had it now because so many of the bugs that they've released actually are chewing out the um, the stem and the uh, root and everything, so that that process that used to happen of stress, yield, rain, grow again, yield, is not happening. It only does it once, and then it's, it's had to go. So I don't think we're going to, and that, Patterson's curse at some years were 40, was 40% 40 of New South Wales honey production. So that's made a big hole. That's why Australia will never, ever have the honey, I cannot see us ever having the honey production that we used to have at the present time. Even with our bigger trucks, bigger forklifts, bigger beekeepers, all that sort of stuff. It's, yeah, and they're getting bigger this way as well, you know? <laughs> but it's, it's, um, it's, I think what's happening is our resources are, are under so much threat now. Um, you know, we've, uh, we're, in a lot of cases we've lost. But that's why um, I think the thing is when you mentioned about land care, I think that is very, very important for beekeepers. Um, the trouble is that, you know, we should have been planting the trees 30 years ago in some cases for, because we, whatever they put in now is going to be too late for me to get it doing good with, you know. But, but, but basically there's some trees and things that we should be encouraging them to grow. I went and spoke to a land care group and I said, you never plant bottle brushes. Or plant bottle brushes, you know. They want all they want to plant is red gums, you know. And someone tells them, oh, red gums and manna gums grow here, so that's all they want to plant, you know, or, or, or wattles. And as I point out to them, the wattles are gone in 10, 15 years. They grow like mad and die and fall over. But a bottle brush 
is a very environmentally good plant because not only does it yield in the spring, you can chop it down and put it to the ground and it'll grow back and they're indestructible. You know, the slash you can go over them and bang up, they come again. But the thing is, they flower often in the autumn as well. So you often get two, if you, and you get the right season, they get a good shower of rain, bang, they'll grow and put more flowers on. So from Vika, and the honey is not unpleasant. It's got a little bit of flavour, but it's not unpleasant. It's not like some of the other honeys that, you know, are pretty, tight, are pretty strong, you know. So, yeah. Now, um, so I've told you about that. Now, when you get your queens, the other thing too is, um, and if you're going to have a go at making your own queens, when you catch your queen, get a unipos pen, marker, put her in the cage, and let her have a, about 30 seconds or so before you put any bees with her. Because what happens is if you put the bee with bees quit straight away, the bees actually chew some of the paint off before it's dry, you know, the marking paint. So let them dry a bit first, and then you'll find that the, and that mark will stay on there just about for all their life. Uh, they might chew a bit of it off, but there'll still be enough there. Now, the worst thing you can do is put the queens on the dashboard of your car or in the sun, <laughs> because they get sunburned and they die very quickly. They don't like it too hot, so they just like it at room temperature or cooler than, you know, um, then they can handle the cool up, but they can't handle the heat. And ants and fly spray. So what I store my queens is I have a hook from the ceiling with a bit of Vaseline around the um, wire, and then I just hang a supermarket bag and the queens are in there, and no fly spray in the house. And that way the ants can't get to the queen. If you leave a queen on a table like that and you've got little black ants around, they'll find that they go for the, the uh, candy, but they kill the queen in the process. Right on. As long as you've got candy and you can top it up, um, they'll last about a week with that amount of candy. You'll see the candy disappearing down to here, and if you're not careful, suddenly they'll eat it all out and they'll be out, uh, unless you put a plug on the end. Um, but the other thing too is, if you want to keep them, plug, put a plug on it, and if you get uh, two frames of brood and the young bees on it, shake them off and put it into like a shoebox or something like that, um, or, or, or better still, with a couple of cones of honey, the bees will feed the queens through there. And that's what they call banking queens. And they and um, uh, a lot of the queen breeders up in Queensland that they keep queens for about a month before they um, that in that way before they send them out. Mm. Is there a drop of water in there? Yes, yeah, so yeah, a little drop of water. And they mm. like that, but just be careful you don't get too much in there because the candy, if it gets wet and sticky, it can wreck them. Um, with gravillias, what do you think about that? Well, gravillias are, yeah, gravillias are good too, but if you get the right varieties. Um, I've never really studied them up enough, you know, to know the right ones. The one I wish I had been able to find out was, I was in Western Australia one time at the Paronga Ups, and there was a big gravillia there, and it just absolutely hummed with bees. It was just, oh, just full of them. But I couldn't find the owner. I walked all around and around and around. I don't know where the owner was, so we had to go to this nursery, so we ended up having to give up. But I'd love to have known what Grevillea it was because it was certainly a good one for bees. This, this little hive, what happened oh, is. Sorry, John. I don't. Grevillea is a flower in winter, so the bees get a chance to fly. You've got something to work on. Yeah. My flowers are about 11 months of the year. Grevillea is superb and Grevillea is moving like the what happened with this little mini nuke? I opened it up and marked the queen a couple of days ago, and whatever I did, I must have upset them. And as a result, you can see that it had good little patches of brood nicked off. So my opinion is when you open them up, catch the queen and take her. Um, don't interfere with them, because otherwise they, they can't be liable to nick off. Hmm. Right on.